My guest tonight is Tony Sani, an investment banker and a woman who has been selected as one of the 100 most influential women in Africa. Tony Sani is the founder, CEO, and executive chair of Emerging Africa Group, a financial services house. Tony was for many years the CEO of United Capital of UBA. Tony was declared the All African Business Woman of the Year in 2017 by CMB Africa and Nigerian CEO of the Year in 2017 by Pell Awards. In 2020, she won the Africa Influencer CEO Award by Tech Times Africa. Tony sits with me to talk about her work with the Lord Jesus Christ and the reason why she does what she does tonight on James Talk Africa. But before we do that, please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think and don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody else. From Cape Town to Cairo and from Mogadishu to Dakar, this is Chim's Talk Africa. And now here's your host, Chim Onyibilanma. Hi there, and welcome to this week's episode of your show. It's happy Easter, happy resurrection weekend from all of us here at Chimstock Africa. You are going to enjoy my conversation with my guest this week. Let's go straight to that interview. Hi there, and welcome to this segment of your show. Like I said in the introduction, my guest today is Tony Isani. She is the Executive Vice Chairman of uh, the Imagine African Group. My dear sister, Tony, you're welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I, I, we, it's just been a pleasure for me to chat with you since I met you today. But one thing that has been on my mind since I read your profile is what kind of background creates a super achiever that is able to have a law degree by 18 years old? What kind of what 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 made you to be that kind of person that by 18 years you had your first degree in law? Thank you. So um, I had a um, a very encouraging background. Let me put it like that. Full of challenges, but I was raised by two fighters. So my father was an accountant and he was also an educationist. He believed so much in education, and not only did he you know sacrifice significantly on a consistent basis to give his children and his wards the best education he could and sometimes could not afford. But he also taught us personally. So he was my first personal teacher. He sat me on his laps and taught me mathematics, taught me economics, um, taught me English language taught me literature, he read literature books to me. My mother was an industrialist and she, and like I said, she was a fighter. She started out, first of all, as um, a stenographer in those days, which was essentially a typist. And then um, she joined the civil service and eventually she realized that um, she needed to do more to support her husband with their seven children and their uncountable wards who were in and out of our house all through my childhood. And so she became a petty trader. Later, she became a, um, a businesswoman. Later, she manufactured tie-dye. She ran a restaurant. She traveled abroad to bring clothes. She eventually ran a chain of boutiques. So between my father and my mother, the earliest lessons for me were the need to be industrious, the need to also know your onions and keep improving yourself intellectually, and very importantly, Whatever it took to provide for your family, it was very important. They sent that message clearly to us that we had to do the best. They had to do the best for us and left me with that value of knowing that I had to do the best for the people that would be entrusted in me or to me over time. I also recognized that life was more than my immediate family because I saw my father and mother raise, you know, a string of nephews and nieces, their own junior siblings as well, the community at large. And so I recognized very early in life that I, I, I wasn't living for myself. I was living essentially for an entire community. I, I give a lot of credit to that background. I also gave my life to Christ very early. 
Um, first of all, as early as the age of four, I had been introduced to Christ by my senior brother who got born again. And then, you know, forgot all about it. But by age 17, while I was in university, I gave my life to Christ. So I would like to believe the combination of um, what my Heavenly Father put in me and what the wonderful earthly parents that he chose for me put in me um, are what have made me who I am today. Wonderful. Tell, tell us about how you gave your life to Christ. So you said it was in the university. What, what happened? You were brought up in a religious setting, Christian setting. Tell us what happened. Thank you. So, so yes, I was brought up in the Anglican church and my parents took us to church from early in life. Um, and, and I don't knock that because I actually believe that early exposure to the teachings of the gospel, even in an Orthodox church, is certainly better than zero exposure. Um, when I was in university, I entered university as I was, you know, j just approaching the age of 15. So clearly, um, I, I was excited and excitable. Um, I was um, overwhelmed by the extreme freedom of life as an undergraduate and um, indeed began to stray from you know, the values with which I was brought up. And um, they, I did a lot of partying. I ran around with a lot of wild people that were you know, probably older and more exposed than me. Remember just how young I was. And um, I was clearly going the wrong way. And only God knows how I would have ended, but it wouldn't have been good at all. Um, I was smoking. Mm. I was drinking alcohol, even at that tender age. Um, and um, I remember one of my friends getting born again, giving her life to Christ. And um, I envied her because I could see that she had broken the chain that I seemed to have found myself trapped in. But I didn't tell her I envied her. I didn't tell her, you know, I didn't ask her how she was able to escape from this horrible cycle that mm -hmm. I had found myself in. I just envied her so much that I attacked her. And so attacked her. I attacked her. And she didn't know <laughs> that the attack was driven by envy. I attacked her, I made fun of her, I ridiculed her, I called her Susu, and I tried my very best to cause her to backslide mm. because I just needed her to be back like me. And um, then there was this Christian sister who was following her up. And so the importance of follow up, you know, cannot be underscored. So she would come around to talk to my friend, to, you know, encourage my friend not to backslide. And so the two of us became opposing forces. I was pulling her, this way. pulling her back to the world. I was desperate. She was my best friend. I needed her back in the world. Today, she's a minister of God Praise as God. well. She and her husband, they run a wonderful ministry in Canada and actually have um, extensions of the ministry in the UK, in mm. Ireland, in Nigeria. Mm. So obviously God has his eyes on her. Um, but I was there doing the devil's business, <laughs> <laughs> trying to make her you know, go back to the world. So this is our mutual friend who was born again, established in the Lord, and it was a more matured Christian. She would come around to invite her to fellowship, to remind her to go to church. And I was always there to remind her not to go. Mm. And I found that I was winning because my friend was, um, one, she liked me very much. We're still great friends mm. today. Two, she was a bit embarrassed. I had made her feel embarrassed about being born again. And so whenever I was around, you know, she would make excuses and not go to fellowship. And I found that she was becoming a bit um, ashamed of her Christian friend. So one of these days when the Christian, our, the Christian sister came again to invite her to fellowship, um, and she saw me there, she would later confess to me that she had gone to God to pray against me. Mm. She had told God, please break the friendship between Tony and my friend. Because obviously my friend is not gonna stand in Christ mm. if, Tony, if she doesn't stop being Tony's friend. And she said the Lord said to her, and what makes you think that I don't want Tony as well? Mm. So she said, God, what are you saying? Change your prayer. Pray for Tony to get saved as well. And honestly speaking, in her views, I was like the devil. 
<laughs> so she she thought that was a, a tall order, but since it was God that asked her to pray, yeah. so she prayed as well. Um, something interesting that I would say also that I was so young, like I said, but I had never had that kind of freedom before. Mm. Totally unfettered mm. freedom, which I misused. And the devil was obviously, he knew, must have known that, you know, I had a great destiny mm. and he wanted to derail me very early in life. So um, my <laughs> later, one of my roommates will say to me that when she was told that I had given my life to Christ. She said it was impossible. Mm. And she said that if Toyin can give her life to Christ, God, even I wow. will get saved. Wow. Meanwhile, this was somebody that I used to look at and think that she was completely wild. Mm. I thought she was completely wild and reckless. Anyway, back to how I got saved. So one of these days, my friend came in again. The, or the, the friend of my friend came around to encourage my friend and the Lord. And there was um, this music playing. It was a, a jazz music i really used to love jazz and mm. blues a lot it was uh, i think just the two of us mm. I, I forget the um the artist now so i was enjoying the music and then she was there talking about jesus again and somehow i just looked up and i looked at her and said so if i give my life to this jesus that you're always preaching I won't be able to listen to good music like this <laughs> i'll start listening to all your susu <laughs> clapping <laughs> And that was the opening that she needed. She just switched over to me. Left said, your friend. Left my friend and said, oh, is that what is bothering you? Wow. Jesus is not asking you to change your music. Mm. He just wants you to accept him as his Lord, as your Lord and personal Savior. When he comes into your heart, wow. whatever he doesn't like, he Ooh, himself he will deal with. You don't, if what has been on your mind was that you needed to, you know, change the music you liked you and make this happen before you come to him, <laughs> And guess what was happening in my head? As she was speaking, a voice was screaming in my head, who asked you to ask her a question? Wow. Tell her to shut up now. Tell wow. her to shut up. Walk out of this place. Tell wow. her to shut up now. Wow. I was hearing wow. that voice in my head. And I couldn't because I've always prided myself, even as an unbeliever, I prided myself that I was cultured and I was a very courteous person. Mm. And as I was hearing that voice, the, my own voice was saying, but I asked her a question. Mm. She has a right to answer the question, but I asked her, because I would never speak with her. Mm. She knows. I would not, ordinarily, I wouldn't speak to her. I would look at her, give her a funny look, and walk away. Mm. I had snubbed her consistently. Mm. But because I posed the question at her, in fact, in the past, if she tried to speak to me, I would be like, who's speaking with you? But because I asked her, that was it. So I had to let her finish. By the time she was done, there were tears in my wow. eyes. Because obviously, I had always wanted mm. what my friend had. Mm. And I gave my life to Christ. On that day, in that you know, dormitory room on the University of Ife campus, wow. um, I surrendered to Jesus wow. and um, cried, asked God to forgive me, and told him all my you know, challenges and problems and addictions at that stage. Because at that stage, I didn't even think it was possible for me to mm. stop smoking. Mm. I had tried and mm. I couldn't stop. But I told him if he would help me, mm. whatever it is that he didn't want in my life, mm. I would surrender to him. Mm. And that became the beginning mm. of my journey wow. and, and, and my salvation. It, this is so interesting. You know, I, I'm... I'm, I'm thinking of something. You've gone from there, 16 year old at that time, to boardrooms, to different platforms as God has elevated you in the marketplace all across Africa. What foundations in those early days as a Christian? I mean, like that lady was following up the other person. Obviously, there were people who came to follow you up. What were the foundations that God built in you that you look back today and say, this, my friend, are the pillars that has Help me in this, my journey in the corporate world, all this one. Thank you. So the first thing that God used for me was Christian literature because I am a reader. And um, so I read some amazing books. You know, one of the first was a book called How to Live Like a King's Kid mm. because I was excited. What thrilled me was the revelations I began to have about who we are in Christ. 
and what is accessible to us as children of God. I had a mind-blowing vision of the, the beauty of life in Christ. And I could never turn away from that. The book was by, I think, Howard Hill, How to Live Like a King's Kid. And, and for me, remember that I had always thought of the born again Christians that I saw as inferior people, mm. as downtrodden, losers, yeah. as losers. That was always the perception mm. I had. They were losers. They couldn't make it in the real world. They were not beautiful enough. They didn't have friends. Nobody wanted them. And that was why they were resorting the to gosh, religion. Yeah. But suddenly, realizing that actually in Christ, I had access to the life of a king child because God himself is a king of kings and the Lord of lords. Mm. And in Christ, you are a king's kid. That blew my mind because I never saw myself as a princess before. And, and so those early revelations of who we are in Christ, also reading so many books by Kenneth Hagin mm. in those early years, mm were a real, they made a real impact on my life. Mm. And I never forgot it. Um, books like The Authority of a Believer, wow. you know, books like You Can Write Your Own Ticket with God. So, so for me, it was beginning to understand that contrary to what I thought, this was more than religion. This was more than um, re a ritualistic um, attempt to impress God. This was not about trying to um, be who I was not. Rather, I could be free to be myself with Christ and to allow him to work on the inside of me. Those were some of the you know, revelations that really helped me. And then I also had experiences of God's power. One of the earliest ones was how he healed me mm. of ulcer. I used to have a terrible ulcer. And um, it was so bad that um, it was the ulcer that dictated when I should eat and what I could eat and what I couldn't eat. And frequently I would land in the hospital and, you know, so it's been with you. It had been with life. me, it had been with me for years. Mm. I would frequently land in hospital being treated for the same ulcer. And then I gave my life to Christ. And, I, and um, after I gave my life to Christ, and I read also about how Jesus bore our sicknesses mm. and that by his stripes we are healed. Yeah. Um, I decided to put that to practice. And I was actually on admission for ulcer when I prayed and I laid hands on myself. Was that I, the same year? Yes, that was the same year I gave my life to Christ. I laid hands on myself and I asked the ulcer to go away. Mm. I told God I never wanted this pain of this ulcer mm. again. And I was 17. Wow. I have never ever had an ulcer again. Glory to God. This was an ulcer that, like I said, would land me in hospital. Now I can fast. I can fast for three days. I can fast for Praise five God. days. I can fast for seven days Praise and not God. eat and nothing would happen to me. Praise um, God. I Praise can God. do a 50 day fast. Of course, mm. 50 days now breaking mm. in the yeah. evenings. But I can do an yeah. unbroken one for five yeah. or seven days yeah. and nothing would happen. The ulcer disappeared completely. Mm. I had so many of such early experiences of God's healing power, you know. Another time I had something that was called tinea and gum, and mm. I was told it was very stubborn, mm. and I was put on medication that was like I had to take perpetually, and I was told that I would have to be coming for liver function tests because the medication could eventually affect my liver. Until one day the Lord said, but I healed you of mm. ulcer. Why Don't you remember this? that? Mm. And I just laid my hands on my extremities, and I commanded tinea and gum to go. And it never came back. So, so I think some of those early experiences of not necessarily being prayed for by mm. some big pastor, not necessarily going to anywhere, but just the personal experiences with God, you know, cemented my faith. And, you know, till tomorrow I know that I can always turn to him in any situation and that he would come through for me. That built an intimacy between you and God. Absolutely. You understood him to be a personal God. God bless you. A God who is here, who is God real. How much has that, how much has that affected the way you've carried yourself in the marketplace? Uh, because people, let me put it like this, people look at business, especially in our context, where many things go. So it's like 
a place you end up getting stained, tarnished. And I'm talking about morally now, in the sense of corruption. Uh, someone said behind every great well, there's a little bit of uh, corruption somewhere. And how much has this reality of who God is, how much has that helped you in walking through the corridors as you saw God elevating you in the corporate world? Thank you. So, so for me, I have no doubt that I am where I am because God brought me here. I mean, I have seen myself um, given opportunities that I didn't necessarily deserve. I see myself operating in a space that is different from what I studied. I studied law. Today, I'm an investment banker. Um, I have seen myself singled out at different times, and I knew it was simply the grace of God. So there's this consciousness in me that but for the grace of God, I am nothing. And if I, am, if I displease God because I want to get ahead and I lose the connection with him, then everything will fall mm. flat. And so that has been my staying power. That is why I am able to walk away from what I can see will not glorify him. Mm. That has always helped me because I know that without him, I am nothing. I don't have any doubt in my mind that it's not my intelligence, mm. um, it's not my connections, it's not my network, it's not my hard work that has put me here. Mm. Oh, I have all of that mm. by the grace of God. Mm. By the grace of God, he gave me a brain. Mm. By the grace of God, he gave me some sound qualifications. Mm. Mm. By the grace of God, he gave me some good you know, relationships mm. in my life. Mm. By the grace of God, I am diligent at what I do, but I can reel off a lot of names of people who will tick all those buckets and mm. who are far mm. from where I am. Mm. So if I cannot see that it is only God that has brought mm. me here, then I must be blind. Mm. Well, in all of your, you, you are one of the top 100 CEOs in Africa, uh, one of the most influential, I think the top 200 inf most influential women in Africa. And the accolades are many. Which of them, uh, which of them is like for you? And I'm, I'm not talking about the spiritual accolades now. Among all your professional accolades, which one is dearest to you? Which of the honors do you look at and say, "Wow, praise God"? <laughs> okay, is so that a difficult question? <laughs> all right, I, I will answer it. I will say until, um, until I founded Emerging Africa, mm. um, the high point of my career to me mm. was when I won the All Africa Business Woman of the Year mm. Award um, um, by the um, Forbes Africa, CNBC Africa mm. sponsored mm. Um, ABLA Awards. Mm. Um, and that was um, in the country where I know you stay, in <laughs> South Africa, um, where we, the, the, the um, final award night was in um, Santin, um, mm. in Johannesburg. And, and for me, that was the, the high point mm. then. And I had told God that I would quit when the ovation was loudest. So on that day, um, at that night, um, I was reminded, or on that night, I was reminded of the promise I'd made to God, and which was why I then opted for voluntary retirement mm. from my role then mm. as Group Chief Executive mm. Officer of um, United Capital or PLC, mm. which was the only investment bank listed on the Nigeria Stock Exchange. Mm. Um, but I have since moved on from there. And so in terms of work and career and professional accomplishment today, what I am most proud of is having founded the Imagine Africa Group and what we have been able to accomplish in less than four years. Wow. Been truly amazing. Let's talk about Imagine Africa Group yeah. uh, because I know it's dear to your heart now, like you rightly said. Why Imagine Africa? Because it was bye bye to corporate life, so it seemed when you said, <laughs> I'm exiting cap uh, United Capital. Uh, and you reshaped the whole country, uh, the whole company, uh, United Africa, United Capital Group. You, from what I understand, you brought it to where it even won accolades as one of the best investment companies uh, at that time. Uh, one would say retire and just and just rest. 
<laughs> even though you were still young. Why Imagine Africa? Where did it come from? What was the, what was the, what was the push to have it? Okay, so you were right um, that at the time I opted for early retirement. Um, my organization, the organization I led, had won, been, first of all, the first organization to win in all five categories of the Pearl Awards that rank the performance of listed companies in Nigeria. Um, that year, we won the sectoral award for the best non-bank financial institution. We won the corporate governance award for the Nigerian company with the best um, listed company with the best corporate governance. We won the highest dividend yield award for giving the highest uh, dividend yield amongst the listed companies that year. We won the best overall company of the year. Mm. And finally, I also won the CEO of the year award, becoming the first woman to win that award in the 22 year history of that award. Now, for me, like you said, I could have gone and retired. But I have a passion to to break barriers, to, um, to transcend limitations. Mm. And up till then, I was finding it hard to find a woman founded, a woman run, both woman founded and woman, woman run financial institution in Africa that was clearly a leader. And so a desire was birthed in me to found, not just to run, but to found and to run um, a financial institution that would be a clear leader mm -hmm. in the markets, and not just a Nigerian leader, but an African leader, and will be able to win the same kind of accolades and awards that I had won at ABLA, mm. but will be a homegrown African business. Mm. I remember on the ABLA night, for example, I saw one or two, you know, I listened, you know, there was a particular business that was founded by a couple, mm. and that business was one of the awardees on that mm. night. And I said to myself, you can do this. Wow. Uh, and... Um, for me, it's always to show others that this can be done. It's possible. So I wanted to show the little girl I had been mm. all those years ago that women can found businesses. Mm. These businesses can become institutions. Mm. These businesses can become known across borders. Wow. And these businesses can endure. Because one of the challenges we also find with African businesses yes. sometimes is Doesn't that go they're, they're one not able generation. to, God bless you, yeah. which is one of the reasons mm. why I am involving the mm. next generation yeah, in, in a lot of what wow. I am doing, so that we can build something that can endure. Obviously, also, access to finance is very dear mm -hmm. to my heart. And I am very conscious of the difficulty that African or some SMEs and African entrepreneurs, especially women, entrepreneurs mm. have raising funding mm. across the continent. So Emerging Africa for me is a vehicle that can bring financial solutions to the underserved across the continent, starting from my own nation, which is Nigeria, and starting from my own constituency, which is women. Wow. Let's talk about your family. Uh, <laughs> You're married to, before I met you today, I said it was Mr. Supportive. <laughs> and you know why I said so? Yeah, on your I profile know. across I the, know. on the internet, it's, I know. you spoke about how supportive your husband has been. And of course, that must be the case for you to have had this much wind behind your sail. Now tell us about Mr. Supportive. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So Mr. Supportive's name is actually Shegun, Shegun Sonny. Um, I have tried to, you know, maybe shield my family. Mm. So you didn't see much mm. about my family from the on the internet, from um, the public view. Not because, um, on the contrary, I have a family to be very proud of yeah. and to be very grateful mm. to God for. But I also think that um, it is important for each of them to be able to exist in their own space and have their own life and not necessarily be dogged by unnecessary media attention. My husband is uh, a banker as well. Um, and today he all, um, he invests in real estate mm. and he also sits on some of the boards of our businesses. We have 10 businesses across the Imagine Africa group today and he provides um, governance guidance and um, the benefit of 
his very rich and vast experience in banking um, to support us in our businesses. How long um, have you been married? Um, <laughs> 31 years, and it will be 32 in October this year. Wow. So I give you an early congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Very early. And you have indeed. three children. Tell us about them, because it seems this banking runs in the vein of the Sunny <laughs> family. Uh, because, you know, you started off as a lawyer. Yeah. Now it's banking. Yeah. Uh, Tell us a bit about the f family, the banking thing that runs through your DNA, and then a bit about your children. <laughs> yes, I, I, th I think it's interesting because, um, in a way, it's like when we study law, we mm. end up in banking. Mm. When we study sciences, <laughs> we end up in banking. When you study accounting, <laughs> you end up in banking. We end up in banking because, um, so my husband studied economics. He's right now um, undergoing his PhD in economics, mm. um, which I'm very excited for him because um, even without the PhD, mm. he has always been an intellectual of mm. very high, mm. um, very high um, skills. Mm. And, and I'm so glad, and uh, especially academic skills, and I'm so glad that he's able to, um, to put that to use mm. today. Mm. Um, my children, my son studied law like me. <laughs> today, he's also an investment bank. banker. <laughs> he's um, heading the public trust division within our trust business. Um, my older daughter um, studied accounting and finance um, for her first degree, and then also had a master's in um, finance at uh, the London School of Economics. She is um, a private equity um, expert and has worked in Morocco and um, prior to now for another private equity firm in Nigeria. She's currently working with us, leading our venture capital initiative, um, working on um, two fund initiatives that uh, we'll be launching later this year. My youngest daughter studied human biosciences and was on her way to become a medical doctor <laughs> and was invited to Nigeria to work for a couple of years before returning. She intended to return to the US to continue um, with medicine and somehow found herself in banking as well. <laughs> Um, <laughs> after a stint at Access Bank, she is actually driving media and corporate communications. Wow. You, you told me before we came on air that this bank yeah. even started even before it, you. It, yes, it's uh, in our blood. So, it's, it's been yes, there so, in the so, system. So my brothers, mm -hmm. were, my brothers, two mm -hmm. of my brothers were bankers. Mm -hmm. My sister was mm -hmm. a banker as well. <laughs> My husband is a banker. His brother is a banker. In fact, he and his brother worked in the same bank. <laughs> At some point, they were both executives in the same bank. So, so it so runs it run, in your veins. Definitely runs in the veins. If you and especially go... my children's veins. OK. <laughs> and it's wonderful that you can incorporate them into what you're doing. And especially yeah. if you look at the kind of vision you're building, imagine uh, Africa. Africa with. Yeah. Uh, it's not something that is meant for just the older ones, but something yeah. that's supposed to go from generation to generation. If you were to go back to Tony at 18 or 20, just stepping into the spaces at that time, now you had the chance to sit with her as I'm sitting with you. What would you say to her? I would say to the 18 year old, um, do everything, the 18 year old me, do everything you do, make every choice in your life with the end in mind. So I would say, if your intention is corporate leadership, start early in that direction. Don't um, allow yourself to go in any other direction. Rather, just stay focused. Um, on what God has called you to do, on how you can impact on your generation. I would also say share the knowledge you have. Share it very early with everybody around you. Because today, I derive the greatest fulfillment in building capacity in the people around me. I wish I had started that very early in life. Um, there was a time we were asked you know, the question, if all jobs paid the same, what would you do? Mm. And when I thought it through, I realized that I would be teaching. Mm. Um, and for a while, I felt a conflict about that because I was like, so if I would be teaching, why am I not teaching? Until I finally understood that you can only teach what you know. And so the reason why I have the exposure that I have 
is so that I can immediately pass that on mm. to those who are coming behind. And that's why today we have the Emerging Africa Capacity Building, and it's a very big part of what we do. So, um, like I said, we have 10 businesses within the group today. So we have the original parent company that is involved in investment um, facilitation, um, principal investments, um, that is also the one spinning off the venture capital business. We have the asset management business. We have the trust business. We have the core advisory business, which is core investment bank, capital markets, um, financial advisory. We have the capacity building business. We have um, the fundor, which is a financial technology business, tech, um, fintech business that we have um, controlling interest in. We have an infrastructure funding business that essentially um, raises um, public debt and funds infrastructure for um, state governments, um, in, um, especially in the north central part of Nigeria. That's the vision to start with. We also have the two microfinance banks that we have invested in. And of course, the venture capital business. Mm. But I'm telling you the truth, amongst all these businesses, the one that probably, you know, that built into the model for the business mm. is my direct investment, or mm. my, sorry, my direct involvement is the capacity building okay. business. So our flagship program is an executive mentorship program, and I am the principal mentor on that program. I devote days, you know, every month to coaching and mentoring, you know, those who participate in that program. And mm. the program is highly successful. We are graduating the second um, cohort on um, the 26th of this month and also inducting the third cohort on mm. the same day. That's wonderful. Tell me, it's been over 30 years in the in this space, yeah. working in the corporate world. Uh, when you look back, are there some things you go, I, I wish I could do that differently. That, that for me, was a low point. And uh, I'm sure God redeemed it, but we sometimes learn a lot from people's failure than even from their success. Correct. So, so the first one I would say is um, there have been times when you knew that you had somebody on your team that you should have let go. Mm. But um, I was sentimental and I didn't let them go. And later, they actually, you know, in one case, the person actually went ahead and committed a fraud wow. on my watch. Wow. And I felt like if I had, um, if I had, when I knew that this person didn't belong, if I had mm. taken the decision then, then the organization would have been spared that ex experience. Luckily, it was a small one. It wasn't a massive one but it was still an error of judgment on my part. Mm. Um, second thing that I definitely regret was um, my first experience as a CEO was not that successful at mm. all. In fact, it was not successful at all. Mm. Um, and I think it was because I was not realistic enough about what the business could achieve. And probably also, the Bible says, the arm of flesh will fail you. Mm. So I thought that, you know, if I put all these things we had learned into place. Mm. Everything will fall into place by itself. It didn't, and I didn't realize early enough. And so we were racking up losses. Mm. Um, but it was a blessing because by the time I left, um, unfortunately, the person that came under me um, was not even mm. able. I was just managing to sustain the business, though it was making losses. The person that came on after me essentially just brought the whole house down. And, but I also feel responsible yeah, because yeah. I was also part of, of the selection yeah. of that mm. person. So for me, the key lessons was, if I had a chance to run a business again, I would double and triple check every aspect of my plans to be sure that indeed my projections were realistic and I would not proceed with anything unless I was sure it would work. Very importantly, that I would not depend on the flesh. I would depend on God. So I asked God for more opportunities. And by the grace of God, the next opportunity I had to be a CEO, I was highly successful. The next one after that, I was even more successful. And the one that I am on now, by His grace, it's been extremely successful. Mm. And for me, every time I remember that the real key to my success today are the lessons, the things I learned yes. never to do again. Is yeah. what I did wrong. 
in that was that your trust. school that was my school unfortunately it was, was not, it was not free of charge <laughs> it was painful for me it was equally painful for the yeah, owners of the business yeah uh, tell me if you look at uh, we're coming to land here but uh, i normally ask this question from people like you who have a continental outlook and a continental reach if there was one thing you would say want to see change that you think would bring a mega uh game changing effect on the continent you know we we have so many issues so many problems mm -hmm. and sometimes you don't know where to start from but as someone who has the kind of perspective you do if there's one thing if you had the power to change that and you like if we touch this this would be a me mega game changer for us in africa what would that be it will be infrastructure mm. the, the state of our infrastructure across the continent is highly highly deplorable um it's um very frustrating for businesses so businesses are having to practically you know provide their own infrastructure to support their businesses provide power provide um, water mm. um, provide roads to where your business mm. is um, pay multiple sums to be able to transport your goods from one end to the other so infrastructure um, is uh, is probably our largest and the one that would be most immediately impactful power infrastructure for, for example, example we would make all the difference in the world if if there was access to, just to change power everything like yes, that. so so that would wow. be that would be a major game changer um, now I would say. if you were to now address the individual christian who, who says okay that's the government and the corporate thing what would you say to him would would he need to do because this program is all about being salt and light and many will look at that and say yes that's the work the government has to do what would you say to that christian watching us what he can do that can bring speeding up the transformation of this continent so i believe that every individual has a gift and has an opportunity to shine a light where we are and the thing that we hate the most in the continent is probably the place where we want to start shining the light. Wow. And, and that is the area, obviously, of um, lack of trust. Mm. So people don't do business with us because they think that we are not trustworthy. Mm. Um, a lot of people are afraid to come to our markets because they believe they will be duped. They are not even sure that their lives and property will be safe because mm. there have been experiences. And so each and every one of us has a responsibility to say, look, so far as it lies with me, you can count on me. I will be honest. I will be sincere. I will not deceive you. I will not um, defraud you. And I will keep my word. So obviously, it's a call to personal integrity. Mm. That's, and that's something any one of us can do, no matter the Absolutely. space we're in. Thank you so much, my dear You're sister, welcome. for today. What will be your last word before you go? Something is on your heart that you've not said, I've not asked about, you know, and... Okay, my last word to everybody listening is that um, God created you for a purpose. You're not here by accident. Every grace, every skill that you possess, every opportunity you've been given, every relationship in your life is all pointing in one direction. And it's the, in the direction of your assignment, what God wants to do with your life. And I encourage you to take the time to seek the face of God and ask him, God, what do you want to do with my life? What am I here for? I personally believe that I am here to help others to see that anything is possible with God on your side. So please, have that conversation with God. He can flip things around for you, no matter how low your position is today. He can turn it around and take you beyond your own imagination. And most importantly, put you in a position in which you can positively impact others. You didn't come to this world for yourself alone. There's so many people whose visions and future are depending on your ability to fulfill yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We've been talking to Tony Sani, the Executive Vice Chair of Imagine Africa Group. And uh, what a wonderful journey you've been on with the Lord. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been a blessing. I'll be right back to round up. Thank you.
Hi there, and welcome back. At this Easter weekend, this is where we draw the curtain. Thank you so much for joining us. I pray that the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus will be your portion. Before we go, I want to encourage you, if you haven't done so yet, consider becoming a partner with us. This program is supported by the generous donations of people like you who believe in what we do here at Chimstock Africa to challenge Christians all across Africa to be salt and light. If you like to give to us, either a one-time gift or a regular gift, use the information on the screen. And to say thank you to you. I would like to send you a copy of my book, God Gives His Children a Song. This is a book that has blessed people all around the world, and I know it will bless you. Thank you so much for joining us this week, and I'll see you same time, same station. Bye. Please like this video and leave a comment below. Let's know what you think, and don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell button and share this video with somebody else.